Man, I'm excited for today. Excited to, to be here. I, I love being a part of this extended family. Uh, my family and I, we live up on the north side of Spokane. And to come and see a lot of familiar faces that were, you know, part of real life before we launched the South Hill. And then to get to meet and see a lot of new faces, for me at least, is, is awesome. I love just seeing God's kingdom grow and advance. And man, it was it was dark and it was early when I got up this morning to, to make my way uh, up the hill. And then um, there was just this nasty thing on my car called frost. Anybody else have to deal with some, some frost this morning? I was like, man, no, it's, it's middle of October. Like, I thought it was too early for that. But maybe I'm just remembering, you know, selected memory from, from last year of like, okay, is it really this time already? Um, but hey, there's, there's one hope that I have. For me, I, I grew up in Alaska. And so no matter how bad it is here, I'm thankful, hey, I'm not in Alaska anymore. Because if it's dark here, it's darker there. If it's cold here, it's colder there. There's more snow. It lasts longer. And so I was like, man, just so thankful that Okay, well, even though there's frost today, it's okay. We'll get the garage cleared out and reclaim that space because now it's a little more urgent, right? Now that the weather's here and now I have some motivation to clear out the garage. But man, I I grew up in Alaska. My dad was an avid outdoorsman. Did a lot of camping and fishing growing up as a kid. And and we we have the state bird in Alaska. If you were to, you know, ask Siri or Google, hey, what's the state bird of Alaska? Um, They're going to tell you the wrong thing. They're going to tell you the willow ptarmigan. That's actually not the state bird of Alaska. Um, The mosquito is actually the state state bird of Alaska. I tell you, we have mosquitoes here, but it's like a different breed up there. They're like the size of pterodactyls. I mean, they will pick up small animals if you leave them out. I'm I'm telling you, like these things are ferocious. And we go camping, like if you had any small little opening in your tent, man, they would make their way in and they would eat you alive. Like you you would open up or, you know, you'd wake up in the morning and all of a sudden you're, you're looking around and you're like, how did the mosquito get there? Like, I feel violated, like, in my sleep. Like, how did the mosquito get to that part of my body? Like, my dad was so funny. He would hear that little sound that, you know, right in his ear. And he would, like, turn on the flashlight. Or if you were home, he would turn on all the lights. And he would not rest until that mosquito was found and dead. And and as as I think about mosquitoes, I I think about what we're talking about today. And I heard this quote that I thought, oh, this is so perfect. It's it's this. If you've ever thought you were too small, to be effective, then clearly you've never been in bed with a mosquito. Because of those little things, right? Like, I don't know where they store all that blood, but man, I've got like 20 bites from one mosquito if, uh, if I miss it, right? And so, but I think about, man, we, we have just overwhelming needs right in front of us. We talk about just what God's called us to, why we planted this church on the South Hill. I mean, 67,000 people who need to know the love of Jesus, like that, that's a big number. That's a big need. Like how big of a building, how big of a church is he going to take, right? Like, Jesus, how are we going to man, reach all those people with, with your love and your grace? Have, have you ever been just overwhelmed by needs? Like, like we just see like just a broken and a, and a, man, just a terrible, hard situation right in front of you. Just, just recently, some, a really good friend of my wife and I, her, her, her husband left. And she's got three boys and they're losing their house because her husband left and, and their finances look drastically different. And my heart breaks. Because I'm like, I, mean, I, I want to find a home for, for, for this mom and her three boys. But man, what, what can I really do? Have you ever been to that spot where you're just almost paralyzed by, feel, by fear and, and overwhelmed by the need around you? And you just, man, either, either we get paralyzed and we don't know what to do so we don't do anything. Or after a while, it becomes so hard to have our hearts break and, and hurt that unintentionally we kind of slip to, to apathy because it's easier not to care because it hurts so much to care when, when I don't know what to do. Have you ever, have you ever thought that of, you know, what, what, what can my effort really do? What, what could one person really do? Well, as we're talking about this heart, God's called us to be for the city, man. Again, we, we look around and, and some of the needs around us are, are really, I mean, they're right there in your face. Addiction, divorce, homelessness and poverty, generational I mean, just, just curses and, and, and just dysfunction going down from family to family through generations. And then there's some of the need that's a little more, a little more covered up. It's, it's covered up by success and surplus, by, by money and, and busyness. And, but the spiritual need is still there all the same because every single one of us and every person around us that we work with, that we live with, that we go to school with, that we do life with, I mean, every one of us is made made for eternity with God. And the only way, Michael was talking about a moment ago, the only way to be made right with God, to be able to spend eternity with him is through Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us on our behalf and to place our faith in Jesus. And man, there's, there's thousands of people around us and the need can be overwhelming. So what do, what do we do with that? 
We're going to look at a passage of scripture, a man by the name of Nehemiah. If you have a Bible or Bible app, I'd love for you to get to Nehemiah, find it in the table of contents. It's in the earlier part of the Bible, but man, it's just such an amazing story of God's word about one man who could have easily just been overwhelmed and paralyzed by the enormity of, of the task in front of him, of the need, of the brokenness, but, but, he, but he chose to step in. So to give you some context, Israel is, is, is God's chosen people. God set them apart and said, if you obey me, if you walk with me, I will be with you. I will bless you. No one be, will be able to stand against you. I will expand your territory. I will take care of your families. And he promises that, but he says also, there's a warning, because if you disobey me, if you walk away from me, chasing after other gods and making life about what you think it should be and not following my commands, then I will leave you. I will allow your enemies to come in and to conquer you and to take you over. Well, God's people rebel against him and he sends them warning after warning. Hey, come back to me. Come back to me. If you would, if you would turn from your wicked ways and return to me now, I'll spare you. I will not punish you. Well, they ignore these warnings after warning after warning and they're taken over by this country called Babylon. And they're actually taken into captivity in this distant country. And, and Nehemiah is, is one man, and he's actually one of the captives in Babylon. And, and his, his, his job is a really interesting job. He's the cupbearer to the king. The king of Babylon is the most powerful man in the world at this time, and he has a lot of enemies. So Nehemiah has the privilege of, just before the king gets ready to sit down and enjoy a meal with his family or with his friends or party, whatever it is, Nehemiah gets to sample the, the drink and all the food. And if Nehemiah doesn't fall over dead, then the king and all his guests get to enjoy the food because he's making sure it's not poison, right? That's an exciting job. Like if you think your job's like dull and boring, just be thankful that you don't have to worry about dying every time you go like to eat something at work, right? That was Nehemiah. I mean, he's not in a great spot to like to do something amazing for God's people. He's a slave to the king who has captured them. Well, Nehemiah re receives a report. Some of his friends come back from, from Jerusalem where God's people used to inhabit. And a few people had been allowed to return and start to kind of try to build the city back up again. And Nehemiah says, hey, how's it going? And his friends are just downcast and heartbreaking. So it's, it's tough. Like we're trying, but man, the city is, is in ruins. The the walls have been torn down. The gates have been burned. I mean, it is dismal. It is, it is desperate there. And, and Nehemiah's heart is, is broken. Here's how Nehemiah responds to this overwhelming need and brokenness that's right in his face. Here's what it says. Nehemiah 1, starting in verse 4. It says, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands. Listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, decrees, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember what you told your servant. If you are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands and live by them, then even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. The people you rescue by your great power and strong hand are your servants. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. And listen to what, what Nehemiah does. When you and I are face to face with overwhelming need right around us, man, the entire city or, or just a, a family, that how, how could I possibly step in and help? Man, he, he doesn't stay at a distance. He, he allows his heart to to break. I know it's an uncomfortable spot for us to be, but it says he mourns, he weeps. I mean, he is on his face. It says night and day. He goes without food. That's, that's how moved he is in his spirit by, by what the, the report says. He hasn't even seen it with his own eyes. It's just what someone's told him. He's, he's heartbroken by it. So, so for you and I, when we see need, man, to allow it to break our hearts, that it would move us to a spot of prayer because by ourselves, man, we're, we're not the answer. 
Like, we can't save anyone. We can't redeem anyone. We can't change anyone's heart. We can't just make a situation that's been broken from generation to generation all of a sudden better and change and look different. But, man, our God can. And so this, that overwhelming need would lead us to a spot of desperation of God. We just sang it a moment ago. God, you are the God of miracles. You're the God who changes lives, changes hearts. Like, you raise the dead to life. God, this is not too hard for you. I beg you, on behalf of these people, would you, would you step in? That's what Nehemiah does. He goes to God on behalf of those. He's not praying for himself here. He acknowledges that, God, I've, I've done my part. Man, I've, I've been selfish. I've sinned against you. But, man, would you bring back your people? Would you, would you be true to your promises? He appeals to God's heart. He says, God, you said that if we repented and turned to you, you would return us back to what you promised. Like when you and I pray, we appeal to God's heart. Jesus you said you came to seek and save the lost, so I am coming before you on behalf of someone I love who is far from you. God, you said that you weren't willing that anyone would perish, but that all would come to repentance. God, would you bring this person to know you? We appeal to God's heart and God's character as he's revealed it through his word as we're moved by the needs and the, the people that we see around us. So Nehemiah prays for, for days, and then he goes in front of the king. And here's what he says, because the king recognizes, hey, something's up, because Nehemiah usually you're pretty happy and, and upbeat and, and you look sad. What's going on? And Nehemiah tells him, well, my homeland where my ancestors are buried, it's, it's in ruins, it's in shambles, and it's breaking my heart. And well, the king says, how can I help? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I love that. Nehemiah prayed for days before this, but then he throws up this like Hail Mary prayer in the moment, right? Just, God, please give me the right words. And he opens his mouth. He says, if it please the king, if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. So Nehemiah prays. He goes before the king, the one who has the authority, humanly speaking, to, to allow him to go and do something about it. And he says, God, would you send me? Like he doesn't pray and, and say, hey, hey, I, king, could you send somebody down there? He's like, no, I'm willing, I'm able. Even though Nehemiah's job situation was a little dicey, like he didn't know if he was going to live or die each meal, right? But he was in the palace, like, he, he got to sleep in a bed. Like, things were comfortable for him, even if he was in the, the, the enemy's territory. Man, at least things were good for him. And he says, God, would you send me in the middle of the brokenness? Like, would you send me to the city where the walls are torn down? And how, how easy is it sometimes to say, I'm going to pray. But then do we pray and do we ask God, expecting that we might be the answer to our prayer? We say, God, would you, would you step in and do a miracle in that person's heart? Would you show them how much you love them? Are, are you prepared when God says, yes, I want to do that through you? Are we ready to be the answer to our own prayer? Because Nehemiah was, he said, send me. I'll go. I, I know it's tough and it's dismal and there's no guarantee of success, but God, I am willing to go on behalf of your people. So he, he's sent. The king grants him favor. He sends him on the way and and Nehemiah goes and he, he takes a tour of the city and he sees with his own eyes just, just, just how tough it is. He sees the walls that are broken down. He sees the families without hope, constantly living in fear, wondering if someone's going to attack them because they have no protection for themselves. How many people do we know who are constantly living in fear because they don't have a foundation that's called Jesus Christ? And so there's some temporary foundation that could crumble at any moment. And so they're constantly living in fear. And Nehemiah goes and he, he sees the families that don't have any protection. And he interacts with them, and he, he invites them to, to join him in what God's put on his heart. And again, this is an entire city. I, I mean, to put a wall around a neighborhood, let alone an entire city, is a massive undertaking. And if Nehemiah is by himself, man, there's, there's no chance. But, but he invites people to join him. And, and here's what it says. I love this in verse 28 of chapter 3. It says, Above the horse gate, the priests repaired the wall. And each one repaired the section immediately across from his own house. And each family took care of the section of the wall right in front of them. So here's what that means. When you and I talk about and several hundred thousand people in this region who don't know, love, or follow Jesus, that is a massive number and a massive undertaking. Reaching the world for Jesus, but it's not just the world. It's the world one person at a time. See, when you and I focus on our section of the wall, it means this. It means you have an immediate context. And within, within your home, your, your spouse, your kids, your roommates, and then those right around you, the people you work with, 
The people who live in the neighborhood where God's placed you. The people who your kids play sports with and, and have different activities with. Man, the, those are the people we focus on. When you and I can focus on, okay, God, what have you put, who have you put right in front of me? Then as we focus on each section of our wall, man, God can transform this city, this region through us. But when we focus on the entire city by ourselves, man, we're crushed by the weight of that. But it says that each person focused on the section in front of their house, their home. They took responsibility for what was right in front of them. What if you and I took responsibility for the people that God has placed right in front of us? There's a family that lives in my neighborhood. My, my wife and I, we met them several years ago. And man, we're, our timeline in our neighborhood is, 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 is kind of shrinking. God's preparing to move us to a different part of the region here to, to, to plant another church. And, but we just sense this burden for this family. We feel like, God, I don't know why, but there's something in our hearts that's telling us that, man, we don't want you to release us from our home until we see them come to know you. And so we're doing everything we can to man, have dinner with them, to reach out to them, to set up play dates. And they know where we're at. We've shared the gospel with them a number of times, but we don't, we don't want to stop initiating and, and reaching out to build a relationship because we believe God's placed them in our lives for a purpose, for a reason. What if you and I took responsibility for the people who are right in front of us? And as we do that, as we step out in, in God's name and with his blessing and his power, man, we have to know opposition is going to come. So the, the enemies who are not wanting Jerusalem to be rebuilt, they start to see the progress being made on the wall. That it's actually starting to come together. And they, they start to like get worried. And so they start to make these threats, telling Nehemiah and those that are working, hey, if you don't stop, we're going to attack. We're not, you're not going to know when, where, or how, but we are going to come upon you, overtake you, and murder you. And this is the threats they make. And here's how Nehemiah responds. He says, then as I looked over the situation... I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Listen to this. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When our enemies heard that we knew of their plans and that God had frustrated them, we all returned to our work on the wall. And it says that each man returned to the work with, with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other hand. They were ready for the attack that, that, that might come against them. And Nehemiah said, hey, if, if you need help, we're going to blow the trumpet and we'll run to your aid. And if we need help, we'll blow our trumpet and you run to our Like we're, we're with each other in this. We might each be focused on our own section, but we don't fight alone. We fight together. And so if you need help, man, we're, let me come and let's pray together. If, if I need help, would you come and, and pray with me on behalf of this family that God's placed on our hearts? And we expect opposition. See, when you and I, when we're, when we're following Jesus and we're, and we're going through life, but it, we're not really looking outside of ourselves, honestly, most of the times the enemy, Satan, like, is pretty content just to kind of leave us alone because we're not really making much of an impact beyond just our own lives. But as soon as you and I start getting our heads up and seeing, okay, maybe, maybe God has a purpose that's not just about me, but he wants to work through my life to impact other people, that's when the enemy gets scared. Because that's when the kingdom starts to grow beyond us. And so, so when you and I start to, start to step into that spot, man, we're stepping into a war zone. And now we've got this target on our backs, and the enemy wants nothing more than to sideline us and to get us out of the way. And so attacks come in our marriage. Attacks come against our kids. Man, these, these attacks are real. I'm not trying to downplay it, but we recognize, man, the, the God that we serve is way bigger and way stronger than the enemy who tries to come at us. So when we face these attacks, man, we ask people around us, would you pray with me? Because as I'm trying to engage in these relationships to share the gospel with the people God's placed around me, man, I see this attack coming. And so I, I need some support. I need some encouragement. I need some help. I don't want to quit. But man, it's, it's hard right now. So we face opposition. We, we, we run to help each other, to, to walk with each other. And when he says, we remember. He says, remember your wives, your brothers, your sisters, your kids, your homes. Remember why you, you start, remember why you're fighting. Remember why we're rebuilding this wall, rebuilding this city. It's because eternity matters. Like, like the people we see around us, they're not just created for the here and the now. Like God made them to exist for eternity and that purpose for eternity is to be with him. And some of them right now, man, they don't have that hope. They don't have that future. They don't have that, that life beyond the here and the now. 
And that's, that's why we pray. That's why we seek for the people that God has around us. Not just that life would be a little bit better right now. Man, that eternity would be changed for them and for those they love and care about as well. So we remember why we're fighting, that God fights with us and we fight together. And as they continue to, man, to stay focused, God does a miracle. Chapter 6, verse 15, it says, So on October 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after we had begun, when our enemies in the surrounding nations heard about it, they were frightened and humiliated. Listen to this. They realized this work had been done with the help of our God. And when you and I, we place ourselves in a spot where we need a miracle, where God has to show up because we don't have the strength, the wisdom, the resources by ourselves to accomplish it. And when God comes through and he does the miracle and lives are being changed, people look and say, wow, that had to have been God because there's no natural way to explain what just happened. And the wall is complete, that the city is, is rebuilt and the people are, are given hope and inspiration that, man, God is for us. So this is the example that we see in Nehemiah. And, and for us, how, how this lands in our hearts and our, our homes and our families this week is, man, God's calling you and me. God's calling every single one of us to fight for your city. And that, that's what God's calling us to, is to fight for your city, to not be overwhelmed, not be crushed by the need around us, not, 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 not be in this spot where it's like, God, I don't know what to do, and so I'm, I'm, I just don't do anything. But we, man, we fight for our city, and that starts like Nehemiah. It starts with, with knowing the condition of our city. And I'm talking about our city. I'm talking about the people around us. This takes relationship. This takes curiosity. It takes humility. It, it, it takes capacity. If, if you and I are so busy going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, I have, I have no margin to have a conversation with my neighbor. I, I have no margin to ask my coworker how they're doing and then to follow up with another question when they pause and hesitate. When we have no margin in, in our thinking or in our time, and it's difficult for us to engage with the people around us. We have to know the condition that takes relationship. That takes humility saying, you know what? Maybe that annoying coworker, the boss I don't like, maybe there's something else going on that I don't know. And that takes a humility to say, I may not know all the details to the story of what's going on in their lives. And so I want to find out. I want to ask questions. I want to be curious. The same way Nehemiah went and actually expected the walls for himself, we, we go and we inspect God, I believe you're working this person's life. Would you show me what you're doing and where you're working? You and I, in order to see God working in people's lives, we have to be with people, right? Like God's not going to show us in a vacuum or show us by ourselves. He's going to show us when we're face-to-face -face over dinner or over a soccer game. We're talking on the sideline. That's when God's going to show us, hey, here's what I'm doing in this person's heart. Here's how I'm preparing them to hear the gospel. But if you and I aren't there, we're going to miss it. So we have to know the condition of our city. And then when God reveals it, man, we get on our face and we pray. We, we pray and we fast, just like Nehemiah. Fasting, from a natural standpoint, makes no sense. Like, why would you go without food? Like, like we're Americans. We don't skip meals, right? Like, that's not what we do. Like, why, why would you do that for a, for a meal or for a day or for multiple days? Like, that doesn't make sense. But spiritually, here's what it does. It zooms us out from the here and the now. See, when you, you and I are focused on the next meal, the next paycheck, the next work day, the next thing on the calendar, it's, we're, we're just going through the motions. I mean, we all get there, right? But you know, when we intentionally set something aside, God zooms out our perspective. Where we're not as focused on the market and, and housing interest rates and, and what, what our boss thinks. We're focused on the people around us and we see them the way God sees them, as people that he's made to exist for eternity with him. And right now they're separated from him. So we allow God to stir in our hearts and we focus our hearts on eternity by setting aside time to, to pray and fast. And we start with the portion of the wall that God's given us. Again, we want to see this entire region, this entire world reach for Jesus one person at a time. That's not only going to happen in, in, in one fill swoop. We, we focus on what God's placing right in front of us. And, and just a story that I want to share to encourage you is, man, as we were starting this, this church on the South Hill several months ago back in you know, early January, we're getting things set up for preview services and just getting everything ready to, to, to go and making sure we, were, we had all all lined up. Man, God was out way ahead of us. And he was showing us, hey, it's, it's about one person at a time. There was a family that just moved back in the area right before we launched our first service. And they came to, to one of the early services. And man, just a few days after they came to the service, their, their little girl, little baby, Scarlett, ended up in the, in the hospital. And, and for several weeks was, was hospitalized, fighting for her life. 
But I want to... I want you to hear Zach's story and just hear the impact of one person as we focus on one person at a time. Let's, let's watch this together. So I am from this area and moved back um, at the beginning of the year. When we moved back, Scarlett was in, put in the hospital for having these breathing episodes um, where her heart actually ended up stopping a total of three times. And come to find out, it was actually my wife who was causing them. Um, so she is no longer in our lives, and um, it's just the two of us. Scarlett also has a rare genetic disorder called Kabuki syndrome, and so that comes with all sorts of complications and other medical things. So we have weekly therapies, um, multiple a week, and specialists and all sorts of stuff. And so it's a whole journey um, for just the two of us now. So I got a call uh, one morning from the chaplain at Sacred Heart, and he called to let me know that Scarlett's heart had stopped, um, and that they had done CPR and they were able to bring her back, but that they were going to move her to the ICU and I needed to get there as soon as possible. And that was really the most horrifying moment in everything, is I wasn't there and she almost didn't make it. So I. On the way to the hospital, it was just such a blur. I don't remember much of the drive other than just crying to the point where I couldn't cry anymore and just praying like I've never prayed before, trying to just beg God to allow her to make it until I got there. And it, it didn't feel real almost that I might not, I'm, that I might lose her. And once I got to the hospital and got to her bedside, it clicked. Um, Philippians, where it talks about God's um, grace surpassing understanding, all of a sudden that made sense. All of a sudden, I had this peace. I, I had this understanding that God had a plan um, and that it was going to be okay and that we were going to make it through this. Um, no matter how that looked, but I just was okay with how it was. I I knew that God was going to provide one way or another. I just needed to lean into Him more and not try and do it on my own. And that was one of the, the big key points in all of this for me, because after that, I've had that, that peace. It, it hasn't meant that I haven't had fears and struggles through all of this, but I know that God's bigger than it. And I, I'm not letting those fears and, and or frustrations control me, but I'm just trying to lean on God and allow him to move and not do it on my own. Right now, God in our lives has really been showing me the need for me to be um, serving and helping. I, I realized um, a few months ago that I needed to kind of look past myself and not just get caught up in all of the the complications that she's had or how many therapies or um, appointments she has, but that I needed to look past that. And by doing that, I've started serving and helping out any way I can. And that has been more fulfilling than probably in anything I've done, um, especially my walk with God is I've grown more as a person and in my faith throughout all of that because all of a sudden I have all of these people around me who are just loving on Scarlett and loving on me and just showing us really who God is in all of this and without that I I couldn't be where I'm at because there there's constant fears of what her next medical complication might be or what the future holds for us but I know that God has shown us through this journey um, his goodness and his his peace in our lives and with that I know we can we can make it through this and it's pretty amazing to see what God can do right that was so cool I I got here a little before seven this morning and and, and Zach and Scarlett had been here for, for a long time before me, I don't know, six o'clock, maybe even earlier, and, and Zach's just kind of got Scarlett in the front pack, and she's just hanging out as he's doing his thing. He's running sound today, so he's been here since 
for a lot of us who are awake this morning. I mean, just think about the faithfulness of, of God in his life and just seeing how God's working. I mean, that, that's the impact is see when you, when you and I, when we, when we fight in our own strength, we, we fight alone, but when we pray, God fights with us and, and for us and to see God's grace and God's hand in Zach's life again, that none of us can step in and have all the answers and, 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 and fix someone else's life. That's not what God's asking us to do, though. He's asking, he said, be, be present, be faithful, be aware, be alert, and watch for opportunities for me to invite you into what I'm doing. Because I'm working in the people's lives around you. But don't miss it. God, God's doing something amazing in this city. He's doing something amazing on the South Hill. I mean, 38 people baptized already in, in a brand new church. I mean, that's, that's incredible. That's a miracle. And so for us this week, here's how we, we fight for our city. We don't try to take on the, the whole thing all at once and ask God to give us the entire burden all at once. It's God, what have you put right in front of me? What's my portion of the wall? And so it's, it's in our homes. I wanna encourage you, husbands and wives, pray with and for each other this week. Pray over your kids and pray that, pray that God's spirit, God's word would come alive for them in their hearts. Let's start in our homes and let's start right in front of our homes with, with our neighborhoods. I want to encourage and challenge all of us this week to, to walk, walk your block, like walk around your block and, and pray. Maybe you do it once, maybe you do it once a day. Maybe you do it with your connect group. You get together and say, hey, we're going to pray as we walk around our, our neighborhood. And just pray that God would give us the eyes to see people who we live around the way he sees them that he would give us the, the opportunities to step in and, and, and share and who he is and how much he, he loves them. Let's, let's start with the portion that God's placed right in front of us. And I recognize, man, there's, there's some of us, again, today, right in front of us, in this room, man, you don't know the love of God. Maybe you've been in church, maybe you know about Jesus, but your life has not been transformed as you've laid everything down. Because as we see in this, in this passage, man, Nehemiah, he left the palace as a slave. He was willing to go and, and get uncomfortable and, and go back to the city that was in shambles and ruins and go back to the broken walls and do what he could to, to build it back up. You know what God did though? Man, Jesus left his throne in heaven and he came to bind up the brokenness in, in your heart and in my heart. But he doesn't force that on us. He says, you have to come to the spot of surrender on your own where you recognize, man, that you need to be saved. You recognize that life in your own strength, in your own power, your own abilities is not going to get you to, to what I have for you, that I've created you for more than just the here and now. I've created you for eternity. I've created you for impact. I've created you to have a purpose beyond just what you can dream of yourself. And man, if that's you today, we want to celebrate with you. We want to baptize. We have everything you need today. We've got the water tank that's full, shirts, shorts, towels, everything you need to take that step of surrender, to, to go underwater the same way Jesus was buried in the grave and to come up out of the water Say, I'm living a new life, no longer in, in, in my strength and in, in my desires, but following God's design for my life. His will, His best is what I'm following. And in a moment here, we're going to pray. And after we're done praying together, I'm going to dismiss. And man, for you to head to the back and talk with our team, we'd love to help you get baptized. But before we do that, man, I want to practice fighting for our city together. So would you stand to your feet with me? We're going we're gonna to pray right now together. Before we respond and worship, I'm just going to ask us to pray that the first thing is this. Would you ask God to give you his eyes and his heart? Man, for the people around you, the people you work with, you, you live around, that you go to school with, that you, you interact with on a weekly basis, ask God to give you his eyes and his heart for every single person that he's placed in your life. Let's ask him right now. Ask him to break your heart the way his heart breaks. Ask him to move you the way his heart is moved by those who are far from him. Let's specifically ask him about those in our homes. Pray for your, your spouse, your kids, your roommates, your friends. Pray for those that you live with. Pray God's design for their lives. God, pray God's blessing. Pray that God would bring healing, would bring life, would bring hope. And then let's pray for the rest of our portion of the wall, for our coworkers, our neighbors, our classmates, 
And let's pray for God's blessing on their lives. Let's pray that God would give us the opportunity to share His goodness, His love, His hope with them. Jesus, we love you. God, we trust you. God, we believe that you are for our city, so we want to be people who are for the city as well, God. We want to be people who are not paralyzed or uh, moved to apathy, God, because the, the need is overwhelming, God, but people who allow our hearts to break, God, allow you to, to speak, to lead us, God, to, to move us, God, that, that we're willing to leave the comfort of, of just what we know life to be, and we're, we're willing to step into the messy, the uncomfortable spots, God, the, the spots where it's hard, where there's no guarantee of how it's gonna go, God, we want to be right in the center of what you're doing, God. We want to be part of lives being changed, of this city, this region being changed and impacted for you, Jesus, that your kingdom, God, would be established here in Spokane, here on earth as it is in heaven, God. Would you make us, God, your people that you can work through, that you can lead, God, to bring about your purposes. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're getting baptized, would you head to the back? We're going to have a team up front that would love to pray with you as well. Let's respond to what God's doing.